I want to get us started this morning uh, by a word of prayer. Um, I want us to pray for the current situation that not only our world and nation is in, but our state in this statewide freeze. Um, we're, as, a, as you may have seen in the email, we're going to meet as a leadership team this afternoon at 3 o'clock to decide how we're going to navigate through this time. I will tell you that as a Pursuit Church, our, um, how we've operated is we want to be respectful of the authorities above us. I don't think that that will change in our response to this. However, we are God's people, and we want God to continue to move in your life, and we don't ever want to see that the church is taking a break. Rather, that we will support whatever we need to do to, con to continue to, for the, the best possible situation for our brothers and our co-workers, our neighbors uh, in town, so that whatever that looks like for us as a church and how we comply with that, God will still be on the throne, right? I mean, we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I believe, just like Robert said, that the Lord is in this place and he's in your life and um, he will guide and direct us. And so just be in prayer for us. Be in prayer for you and how you're handling this and your response to this as well. I also want to pray for our churches in, in town. Obviously, having um, Michael and his wife and uh, Ron with us this morning reminds us that we're not the only church in town and that God is using every church that believes in him as Lord and Savior and preaches from his word. God's using his church at large and it's cool that we are a part of that together. Isn't that awesome? And so it's a great reminder, it's a great visual that we can partner together in ministry like that. So I want to pray for that as well. So would you join me in a word of prayer before we get into God's word? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to honor you, to worship you. Lord, may you have your way. May, may you break the chains. May you be honored and lifted up. Thank you for the reminder of that in these songs we've sung. Lord, I pray that you will help your church to move forward. Even in a two-week freeze, that doesn't mean that you froze. You continue to live, and you continue to move, and you are alive and reigning on high. And so, God, may we model that in our lives. I pray that you'll give us discernment and how we help to move the church forward and help disciple people and honor you during this time. And we know that, Lord, you're going to give us what we need in that. I pray you give us all understanding and all of us patience and also the spirit of, of moving forward, like you've um, already challenged Robert with. Lord, thank you for this church, Pursuit Church, but thank you for all the other churches that are meeting this morning and some that can't. Uh, thank you for our River Valley Church and their campuses, and I pray that you will bless every pastor, every person who is preaching your word this morning, and every person that is, that is receiving the word. Lord, may you do a work in their hearts and lives, and I thank you that we are a part of a of a grand thing beyond just these walls. And I thank you, Lord, that you're, you're having your way in your people uh, to reach those that are, still don't know you as Savior. We thank you for that. Would you bless your word as we receive it? May we use it to become more and more like you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're joining us new, we are in the middle of an, a series called The Creed. Creed. It's, this is a study of the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed... It's a really great statement to know and to even memorize because it is pretty much um, the, the, when you boil it all down, what's left is the Apostles' Creed. If you say, hey, what do you believe as a believer in Jesus Christ? What's the Bible all about? What is this gospel? What is this message? You could quote the Apostles' Creed and give pretty much all of the foundational statements of what it means to be a Christian, follower of Jesus Christ, and a part of his body. And so that's what we've been going through. Last week, we talked about that he is risen on the third day. And uh, if you missed that, that, I encourage you to go back and, uh, and watch that on YouTube and catch what Eli and Rachel and Aaliyah caught. I said a word during the boxing match. Do you remember that? Okay. So report back to me if you missed it and you want to go back what I said that was a, it was kind of a, a liberal loo of a couple words there together. And so um, anyway, that was fun. Um, I love that, by the way, when someone goes, hey, did you realize what you said? And I'll go, no, I didn't. What did I say? And they'll tell me. I'm like, oh, that's hilarious. So if you want to go back and watch it, then there you go. <laughs> so we're in part five of our study of the Apostles' Creed. And so we're going to read this together. You, uh, I'm pretty sure that you're cool with reading this out loud with me. Um, and so let's do this together. If you are visiting and this is not your statement of belief, it's okay just to listen. It's all right. But we as the body of Christ, as the church, we really believe in this statement, not only because it's truth, 
because it really does dictate how I behave every single day and who I am in Christ every single day. That's what we've been finding out these weeks into this. So here we go. We're going to look at this on the screen. It's Apostles' Creed. Let's read this out together. Here we go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What a great statement of belief. What a great statement to to just know, but also have confidence in. I love that. So we're going to look specifically at this portion of the Apostles' Creed today, and it's this, that Jesus ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Now, I want us to look at these events as recorded in Scripture as we dive into this. We're going to look at what Luke and Mark, these gospel writers, taught and wrote down, and they learned from Peter and from Paul. And we're going to look at what Luke first recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 1. It'll be on the screen. But this is about the ascension of Jesus. After his resurrection, then they, which is Jesus' disciples, gathered around him, Jesus, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem here, in Judea there, in Samaria over there, and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now this is the verse that we would say, Jesus' ascension. Okay, that's what we would call that, is that Jesus went up before their very eyes. Verse 10 continues, he says, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, and I could just vision them like squinting, going, is that him? No, no, that's, that's not, is that it? Yeah, I think that's still him. And when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken, taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you see him go into heaven. Now, Mark gives us, in the Gospel of Mark, this scenario in his perspective, in his words, and adds something else that's really important for us today. So let's read Mark's account in chapter 16. He says this, Then he, Jesus, told them, who? Jesus' disciples, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Skipping down to verse 19. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. Here we have the depictions in Acts and Mark of the ascension of Jesus. Now, what does it mean to ascend? How many of you this past summer went hiking up some kind of a mountain or some kind of a hill, okay? All right, when you hiked up, you went up. And so the word ascend means up. So you ascended the mountain. If you want to sound like you really did some good hiking when you're telling your story, say, I ascended the mountain, okay? And you can just stand there like you conquer something or whatever, I don't know. It means to go up. It means to go up. Now, the technical meaning of ascension in Scripture is to go up for a specific purpose or a specific task, a specific mission. So if you're backpacking or hiking and you have breakfast in your pack and you go up early in the morning, you ascend the mountain to cook breakfast and to make pour over coffee and just enjoy that time up there, right? You go up for a specific task. If you have a flag that your family owns, you know, you can go up there and I declare this land my family's and BLM. You know, it's like whatever you want to go up there for a task, right? It's a mission. 
Jesus left this earth. He went up to heaven after his resurrection from where he came. But Jesus goes up to attend to work. He goes up to the heavens to go to work as our high priest. What does that mean that he goes up as our high priest? That was his mission. That was his his task. Well, I want to give you a little bit of a heads up on a high priest in the OT. That's Old Testament. In the Old Testament, he, the, uh, and I'm going to show you a picture that was, this isn't an actual picture of back then because I couldn't find any of those on Google. So this is one that somebody drew. But anyway, this would be an idea of the high priest who was a chief religious officer, uh, official in the temple of Jerusalem. Now, he had many tasks, but one specifically that was unique to the high priest alone was he was privileged to enter into the Holy of Holies, the inter sanctium. This is the place where God's presence dwelt, and nobody was allowed in there except for the high priest on one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where he would represent the people before God's presence. And he would burn incense and sprinkle the sacrificial animal blood to make amends for his sins and the sins of God's people. That was his role. He stood in the gap between God's people and God's presence. He came before God's presence, representing God's people, and said, the people have sinned, and we ask for your forgiveness. And he would do that every single year. He stood in the gap. You see, Jesus is our ultimate high priest. Jesus stood in the gap because our sin, we can't go in the presence of God. They couldn't go in the presence of God because it would not be good. You cannot go in the presence of God and be sinful. It would just poof, you know, gone. Okay. There's, it's not possible. And so Jesus came and stood in the gap because God's design is that my people would have a relationship with me. They could come to me. And so Jesus took on the sins, your sins and mine, of the world on himself, on the cross, died for us. He became the sacrificial lamb, and he sprinkled his own blood so that we can then know God personally. Amen. He stood in the gap. He, see, because of what Jesus did, we no longer have to say, um, <clears throat> excuse me, priest, pastor, father, I sinned. And what I need you to do for me is I need you to to take this blood that's been sacrificed because the penalty for sin is death. I'm aware of that. So this animal died and this blood is representing my sin. I need you to take this and go into that holy of holies where, and I need you to sprinkle on there, ask for forgiveness for me and come back. I need you to do that for me. See, we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to do what the Old Testament said to do for, because Jesus did that for us. He is our ultimate high priest. And when he came to earth and he died and he was buried and he rose again and he ascended, he changed it all for us. We no longer have to go through that process. The writer of Hebrews explains it very well for us. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says this. So then, since we have a great high priest, he's talking about Jesus, who has entered into heaven, his ascension, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. How? Well, for he faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. Verse 16, so let us come boldly. Can you say the word boldly with me? Come on. Boldly. Okay, come on, overflow. Say it with me. Boldly. There we go. We can come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. How many of you need mercy? How many of you need grace? And we need it, don't we? But we can come boldly to God because of what Jesus did as our high priest. That is beautiful news. Why? Because if you have prayed today, if you prayed this morning, if you prayed here in church, which I know most of us all did, we can pray boldly because of what Jesus did. If you've ever prayed in your car, like, this is my time, me and Jesus, I'm on my way to work. You know, I turn the radio off and it's just me and the Lord. You can do that boldly because Jesus did the work ahead of time so you can come to him to receive the mercy and the grace when you need it the most. That is such good news for us. He wants a relationship that's personal. He wants us to, to know him. We can go directly to God now. He did all this work for us. 
So the question is, now that Jesus has ascended and he's seated at, seated at the right hand, is his work over? He did a lot of work for us. I mean, he came to earth, he lived the full life of ministry, he mentored the apostles, he healed the sick, he cared for the outcasts, he taught the wisdom and with wisdom and knowledge. Sorry, Pastor Mary Lou, for translating all this right now. He led with humble courage, truth, and justice. He was arrested, he was beaten, he was mocked, he crucified on a cross, which he carried part of the way, by the way. He died for our, the sins of the world, which includes yours and mine. He rose again on the third day. He appeared to over 500 people after resurrection in a 40-day period. He commissioned his followers to go and make more disciples. Then he ascended into heaven. <gasps> Whew! I think Jesus deserves a break. What do you think? I mean, after all, he is seated, isn't he? That's what, that's what Mark says. He's, he went up to heaven and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. But what does that mean, to be seated? I can assure you that Jesus is not on a break. I want to read for you Hebrews 1, 3. This is the second half of that. It's on the screen. It says, When he, Jesus, had cleansed us from our sins... He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Do you know what it means for Jesus to be seated at the right hand of God? It's not a place. It's a position. We don't take this literally, that he's literally sitting down. This means that just as in ancient times, a person with the highest rank would be standing at the right hand of the king or sitting at the right hand of the prince. This person had the highest rank, and so that's where they would sit. That's where they would stand. You see, this doesn't mean that Jesus is sitting down on a break. This means that he has ultimate authority, and he rules with all dignity and majesty and holiness. Jesus is exalted to the highest place, he rules over the angels in heaven, over us here on earth, over every molecule in the universe. He has authority and dominion over it all because he is at the right hand. That means he deserves every ounce of worship that we gave him today. He deserves that every breath that we have in our lives because he is exalted and lifted up. He is our king, our Lord. And he has been reestablished as he goes into the throne room. Yes, he subjected himself, right? When he came to the earth, he subjected himself to, to the very patterns of, of the laws of physics in our world. And he even subjected his own body to death on a cross. But he rose again. And he is seated and on high. See, he never lost who he was as high and lifted up because he is exalted. King of kings. And Lord of Lords. So when we worship Him, when we give our lives to Him, we're giving our lives to one who is exalted and lifted up. And let me assure you that Jesus is not sitting down and taking a rest because He has ascended and He's, He is not. As high priest, what is He doing? He's continuing to work on our behalf, right? I mean, I've, they say Jesus was a carpenter when He was on this earth. And as high priest, when he goes up into heaven, he's just not taking a break. He's strapping on his tools, and he's going to work for his people, right? He is our high priest. What does that mean? That means he has way more tools in the tool belt than I do, because <laughs> this is kind of empty. But he goes to work for us. He, he, as a high priest, he goes into the Holy of Holies, and he, he, on our behalf, he listens and answers our prayer. How many of you guys have prayed um, at least once this week? How many at least twice this week? Okay, we represent a very small part of the population on this earth. How many prayers have lifted up to the Lord? He hears every prayer. He is at work for us, and he's answering prayer. God is listening. He's actively at work for you and I. Not only that, but he sent his Holy Spirit. He sends his Holy Spirit down, and he goes, okay, well, let's, uh, let's work on you a little bit here, uh, Dan. All right, you know? Okay, let's get to, you know, I've got some work I want to do in you. And his Holy Spirit, he will mold us and guide us. And he convicts the world of sin. He does so much work on our behalf. He is not just sitting down. He's at work. Not only that, 
Not only is he as our high priest interceding, listening to our prayers, answering those prayers, um, and by the way, going before us so that we can come boldly to him. I mean, that's an amazing thing. But Jesus also tells us he's doing something else while he's there. In John 14, verse 3, Jesus says this, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. What is he doing? Jesus is preparing heaven for me. He's preparing heaven for you. Now, I don't know what that looks like. Okay, I don't know if that means he gave the angels some more, you know, safety yellow vests and says, cone this off. We got to put a new, you know, gold, gold road through here because we got to build some more mansions up in this neighborhood. I mean, did you see Pursuit Church last week? The two people gave their life to Christ and woohoo, this is awesome. God's people are doing some work. The Holy Spirit's doing it. This is, let's keep building, guys. You know, so they're, you know, and they're built. I don't know what they're doing up there. But they're preparing heaven for us. That's what Jesus is doing. So I'm going to prepare a place for you. Here's the deal, though. I think that when Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, yes, he's preparing heaven for us, but I think more than that, he's preparing me for heaven. I think that the work he does in that preparation has a lot more to do with the work he's doing in me rather than just what he's doing up there. Because he not only wants to be ruler and is the ruler over all, but he wants to be ruler of your heart. He wants to come and dwell in your life, and he wants to do a work in you. And you know what's so cool about our God is that the work he started, he will be faithful to complete. In other words, he's not done with you yet. You could look at the person next to you and say, well, amen to that one. You know, <laughs> He's still working on you. That's awesome. Paul urges the church in Philippi, He says, hey, God's working in you guys. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep moving at it. And so what does he say? This is the word he gives to Philippians 2 that I think we should receive this morning as well. In verse 13 through 16, he says, for God is working in you. Go ahead and tell the person next to you, God is working in you. Tell them. Come on, preach it to them. Now tell the other person. All right, did you get that overflow? Did you tell? Okay, good. God is working in you. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That's the work he's doing. He's given you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. By the way, we're going to talk more about what that looks like when the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. Um, I believe that's next week. And he says, he gives some examples. He says this to the church, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Wait, can we back up a little bit? Beep, beep, beep. Let's go back to verse 14. Do everything without complaining and arguing. We've just received some new mandates from our governor. My question to us is this. How are we a witness to the people around us? If all we do is, well, I'm not complaining. I'm just going to get everything else. Well, I'm fine. I don't even got to work to do this. Thanksgiving. Because she knows what Thanksgiving. I'm going to put a mask on my house. I'm going to put a mask on my house. No, I'm not. I'm not. I just heard my wife say, he's totally mimicking me. <laughs> no, I'm not. Well, you did, but we're not. That's not what I was thinking at all. Like, I, it was Christina conversation over here. I'm preaching over here. I did not see those come together right now at all. You can check my notes. It does not say talk like Christina at all in here. <laughs> wow, that one got a snort. That was awesome. Woo! Preach it, Brother Rex. <laughs> I don't know who that was, but that was great. <laughs> can I tell you that the Holy Spirit is alive and at work in his church and you and I. And you know what? The world is watching. And yeah, we can stand for truth. You know, we can stand for things that we deserve to, you know, justice and those kinds of things. But sometimes we fall in these little categories and we find these little areas that we just want to rant on and on about. But should we seek the kingdom of God first and not seek the complaining kingdom first? I think Paul knew what he was talking about. It wasn't just happening in the church in Philippi. It was happening all the time. He says, live clean, 
innocent lives as children of God. See, we're reflecting. He says we're shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day that Christ returns, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. What is Paul saying? Guys, I want you to be a little bit of heaven on earth. I want you to shine like Jesus is doing, what Jesus is doing in your life. Let it out so that the world can see. Don't give them any, any area in your life to go, oh, see, the Christian, I knew it, hypocrite. Three words for you, hypocrite. No. We want to live, yeah, we're not perfect, right? I'm not saying we're going to be just floating across the ground wherever we go. But God's doing a work in us. And God is, remember you told the person next to you, God is working in you. So let him. Let him prepare you for heaven. Because that's the work that God is doing right now. He is at work. And he's at work in your life, in my life, in our church, in our community, at River Valley, at uh, Hope, Hope Link or Link Hope or the, the new church around the corner. I mean, God is at work. So let's not waste our lives outside of God's will. Do we just kind of come to that like, I'm not going to waste my life. God, the work you're doing in me, I want to see that happen. I don't want to waste my life any other way. My question to you is, what is God calling you to do in his name? What is it that you might be sitting on your hands a little bit, like, oh, I'm not sure about that. That's a little uncomfortable. But if God is moving you to that, no, he's going to equip you for whatever it is that he's calling you to. See, if God has done all this work, then his people have work to do as well. And our relationship with God is directly influenced and a part of our relationship with other people. It's an L-shaped relationship. I love God, so I love people. I honor the Lord, so I honor others. So what is God calling you to do in his name? Maybe it's to reach out to, to a friend who's lonely and encourage them. Maybe it's to mend a broken relationship that you're just like, I'm not going there. Are you kidding me? Maybe it's time for forgiveness. Maybe it's time to start to really dig into God's word and prayer and say no to this so you can say yes to that new discipline in your life. Maybe God is calling you into a life of, of ministry to be a part of preaching and reaching for the gospel full time or serving in some capacity to the church so that you can be a part of spreading the gospel in your community, in your neighborhood. What is it that God is, is just drawing you to? Can I encourage you to say yes God, your will be done in my life. God, your work in me. Because here's the deal. We're held accountable for the days that we have on this earth. We are. Just as the Apostles' Creed that we read, it said that Jesus is coming back. It reminds me of that song by Crystal Lewis. People get ready. Jesus is coming. Soon we'll be going home. Right? It's true. Jesus is coming back. And the Apostles' Creed reads just as Scripture shares with us that he is coming back to judge the living and the dead. Matthew records Jesus' word to his followers in this regards, and he says this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in all in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. That's a big oh, moment for us, isn't it? Like, whoa. You know, the beauty of it is that Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that our sins can be forgiven. And when Jesus judges those who follow after him and receive Jesus, he doesn't look at our past sin. He sees those who have been forgiven. I love that. But we still have each day to live out. And God will come, Jesus will come back and he will judge according to what's been going on on this, on this earth, how we've used our days. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like when Jesus comes to judge? Well, Jesus spoke to that because they, his disciples were wondering too, what does that look like when you come back and judge us? Like, I, I don't know. Is this, how, how scary is this going to be for me? You know, what is this going to look like? And Jesus says, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come in all my glory. And then I'm going to separate the sheep and the goats. Right? Well, I'm going to have those, those on my right-hand side and I'm going to have a group on my left. And those on the right on the right, I'm going to say, well done, 
my good and faithful servants, I want you to come on in, enter. I've been preparing a place for you, and you are welcome on in. Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was sick or in prison, you came and looked after me. You came in to visit me. When I didn't have any clothes, you gave me some clothes. And they're going to go, Jesus, when did we see you like that? I don't remember that. Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these, when you did it to those who the world doesn't care about anymore, those who are overlooked, when you cared for those people, you did that for me. So welcome on in. See, we, those people stewarded their days well because they understood that the love of God translates to the love of people. And then he's going to look at those on his left and he's going to say, depart from me, for you refused to give those who were hungry something to eat and those who were thirsty something to drink and those who, who, who were sick or in prison. You didn't go visit them. You didn't do anything about it. You didn't care. And they're going to go, whoa, 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 hold on. I didn't see you. Jesus, I didn't see you. Like, I would have totally. And he's like, it's because you didn't do it to the least of these. Because you didn't care it one bit. And so we're held accountable to the days we're given. And if we give our lives to Jesus Christ and we surrender under his lordship, he's going to guide us. He's going to say, this is how I want you to love. This is how I want you to feed. This is how I want you to care. This is how I want you to visit. And we're going to go, yes, Lord, do your work in me because I want to do that for other people. That's what makes God's church so powerful, that in Jesus' name, when we do something, even if it's a cup of water, there's power in that because we are showing the love of Christ that he showed us. And I know Pursuit Church, we're always going to give anybody the opportunity to respond to that message. Because Jesus forgives us, we want to tell everybody that Jesus forgives and loves and has a plan for you to continue on what he's doing. I hope that we, before we leave this place, can say, Lord, use me. Lord, the work you're doing in me, would you keep doing it? It might be a little uncomfortable sometimes, but God, here I am. I pray that we do more than just, Lord, save me, but Lord, sanctify me. Lord, would you fill me with your presence? And I want to be bent towards you so that every day I wake up, I say, Lord, what do you have for me today? What do you want for me? Not what does Rex want for Rex? See, that's a life that's completely surrendered. It's just, Lord, here I am. God, have your way in me. I'm not sure exactly where every one of you are in this. Some of you new to faith, still understanding what that looks like to follow after Jesus, and he's showing you every day. Some of us have been following Jesus for a long time, but we've, we've gotten a little complacent. And the Lord's been challenging us, and we've been going, ah, oh, I don't know, let's leave that for the younger folks, you know, those that, no, God still wants to use you. God still has a place for you. You're a part of the body, and we, together, honor the Lord with what we're doing. We're going to take some moment right now to, to pray and to worship again. The team's going to come back up. And really, this time is designed for you here in the sanctuary in the overflow to spend some time praying and worshiping the one who is seated at the right hand, the one who has gone before you. And I want to encourage you, pray right where you're at. You can turn around and kneel down right there and just have a prayer of surrender. Lord, this is my life. I surrender it to you. Just do with it what you want. Wherever you're calling me to do and whatever you are asking me tomorrow to do, I want to do your will. You may want to even come down to these altars. Overflow, you can do the same thing. You can come in here at these altars. If you want to remain right where you're sitting, you can stand, you can kneel, but put yourself in a posture where you can pray and say, Lord, have your way in me. Lord, have your way in me. Thank you, Lord. Let's use this time to speak to the Lord as we worship. Sing along, pray. Let the Lord have his way in you. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to him and give you a better understanding of his word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, 
please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.